At the beginning of the 20th century, the population of Paris was greater than it is today. Various means of public transport were already part of the Paris scene. Its public transport is as much a part of the heritage of Paris as its historic monuments. It's thanks to all the different ways of getting around that today, Paris keeps on the move. has had public transport services since the 17th century. Hackney cabs, buses, trams, at the beginning were all pulled by horses. Much later on, mechanical means took over. In 1875, the first motorized trams were put into service. But it wasn't until 1913 that the horse-drawn bus finally disappeared. However, Paris always had one natural communication route, the Seine. In 1866, the boats, which mainly carried goods, started carrying passengers. Regular river bus services, they were already bateau mouche, made frequent stops along the river. Passengers realized that the city was even more beautiful seen from the Seine. The Palais du Trocadéro. The Pont des Arts. The Grand Palais. the statue of Henry IV. The Conciergerie. The Pont Neuf. Buses. They've been crisscrossing Paris since 1906. Electric trams. They were at first confined to the suburbs because the overhead lines were considered too ugly for the capital. But the mechanical trams conquered Paris at the beginning of the 1900s. They had priority over all the other vehicles in Paris. But the fact that they were competing with all the other traffic caused their downfall. They disappeared temporarily in 1937. A major event aroused skepticism. The launch of the Underground Railway. Parisians are not moles. They will never go down into that hole. 
wrong. The metro was an immediate success, and the Compagnie du Chemin de Fer Métropolitain, the Metropolitan Railway Company, attracted hordes of passengers. The decision to create this new means of transport had been taken five years earlier. The Universal Exhibition of 1889 had left some bad memories because of the inadequacy of public transport. Paris could not afford to allow further lapses with the prospect of another event which was to mark the start of the 20th century, the Universal Exhibition of 1900. The exhibition was visited by 50 million people. It was a huge success and contributed greatly to the growing influence of Paris. Thirty years later, the International Colonial Exhibition was held at the Porte Dorée in the Bois de Vincennes. The colonial exhibition received 34 million visitors in six months. Paris had greatly improved its public transport service, largely thanks to the metro, which had progressed in leaps and bounds since 1900. It was only after 40 years of dithering and a whole variety of schemes that, on the 22nd of November 1895, the government decided to go ahead with an underground railway in Paris. The city council was given the responsibility of designing and developing its metro. This had to be ready by the 14th of April 1900 for the opening of the Universal Exhibition. The work went ahead at a furious pace. Line 1 was completed in only 17 months. It ran from the Porte Maillot to the Porte de Vincennes. Despite this achievement, it was only inaugurated on the 19th of July, three months after the exhibition opened. The nature of Paris's substratum was full of surprises, and often great imagination was needed to find appropriate technical solutions. Clive Lanning is a railway specialist. The Paris Metro is special in one way. It is not very deep. It's an urban tramway that is built 10 to 15 meters below street level. This is the cut and cover system, which consisted of digging a trench in the streets, which was quite a considerable task, and then covering it with a road surface. And to tunnel the first lines, they simply followed the street plan. So it was a metro that cost relatively little and which followed the streets, which very rarely ran under houses. The only exception was where it had to pass under the Seine. And the first carriages, made of wood, were designed to meet the standards of an underground railway. The metro quickly became very popular. Each new line was opened with great pomp and ceremony. And the politicians quickly realized the advantage they could draw from it. It was the thing to be seen and take part in the inaugurations. February 16, 1930 marks a new and important stage in the history of the Paris Metro. On this day, the Minister of Works has the honor of inaugurating five kilometers of line at the heart of a particularly densely populated area, which up to now has been deprived of public transport. The new lines were opened with great commotion, and Georges Pernaud, the Minister of Works, was determined to be the first to test the new lines. As the population of Paris became more and more dense and traffic more difficult, we built, or rather dug, new tunnels and ever-increasing numbers of trains carried more and more passengers along the metro lines. And station after station was opened. More than 320 of them between 1900 and 1937, leaving no spot in Paris more than 400 meters from a metro entrance. You got, you got, you got. 
And it is particularly thanks to all these major works that today Paris is always on the move. The name of one station in particular recalls a whole chapter in the history of the metro. Montparnasse Bienvenue. But actually, why Bienvenue? I really don't know. I don't know. No, I haven't an idea. I don't know. We don't know. We are from Israel. I often wonder, but I don't know the answer. I don't know. Uh, perhaps it's for the tourists or for the tower. Because the city is very welcoming. Well, I believe he was the creator of the metro. Isn't he the man who started the Paris metro? Yes? I'm not sure. Monsieur Bienvenue, on whom the intelligent, grateful people of Paris have bestowed the undying title of Father of the Paris Metro. Fulgence Bienvenue, graduate of the École Polytechnique, civil engineer and a Breton, devoted 34 years of his life to the construction and development of the metro. It was he who decided that all the lines would be independent, so that passengers would not have to worry about the destination of the train when it entered the station. When the current plans have been carried out, the lines overall will cover more than 160 kilometers in the urban network, and over 200 kilometers once they are extended into the suburbs. The man was tenacious, and his vision was a long-term one. In 1929, at the age of 77, he started on the great program to extend the lines of the metro into the suburbs. Fulgence Bienvenue retired at the age of 80 and left as his legacy one of the greatest urban creations of the 20th century. It's a feat which is as important today, I would say, as putting a man on the moon, because with the Paris Metro, we've managed to achieve technical feats underground in places that we'd never been before. One of the technical feats, the Saint-Michel station. At this point, Line 4 had to cross the Seine. It was decided to make the sections of the station out of metal and then bury them in the ground. Here, too, they had to find some ingenious solutions. Antoine Dupin, regional director of the RATP. For example, to cross the Seine at Saint-Michel, a deep freezing plant was built to freeze the very soft earth underneath the Seine. Indeed, the ground had to be hard to be able to dig a trench that could take the enormous caissons which would form the tunnel under the Seine. Five caissons with a total length of over 440 meters had to be sunk to create the tunnel. The enormous vessel, like the hull of a ship, gurgled as it went down. It was like the hull of the Titanic, which came to rest down where the line is now. Another example of ingenuity, the Gare de l'Est metro station. Here they had to take the metro under the main railway station. If we saw it through this column, it would be very dangerous because it replaces one of the pillars of the original building and, in short, allows the metro to be situated under the front corner. This pillar is at the heart of the very complex system that exists between the metro and the Gare de l'Est. The one had to accept the other and that was quite something. 
This station is the greatest work of art of its kind in the Paris metro network, with its very long metal struts, which support the road above. If I just went up straight, I'd come out under the wheels of the taxis that are parked only four meters above. So we're at the heart of a very complex technical world. The designers of the metro took great pride in some works which combined technical feats and architectural beauty. The viaduct at Austerlitz is a fine example. The challenge was to cross the Seine and the ports of Austerlitz and La Rappe over a distance of nearly 900 meters in one great stride. A structure with a span of 140 meters between its two pillars was built during 1903 and 1904. The Austerlitz viaduct was longer than the Alexandre III bridge with its 107.5 meter span. The Austerlitz viaduct was illuminated for its entry into the 21st century and will long remain a model for the marriage of technical progress with beautiful design. For over a century, designers, engineers and laborers have been working together on the development of the metro and exploring new techniques. The major technical evolution of the end of the last century was, first of all, the creation of metros running on tires. We went from the iron wheels to the rubber tire. And also to the automatic metro, since, with Line 14, the RATP pioneered the automatic driverless metro. For all this to work, there must be a payment system and, above all, very good organization. Up until the 1970s, a human presence was necessary for all these functions. It took between 20 and 30 years for the machine to take over some of these tasks. For some of them, man was considered irreplaceable. Until 1971, each train had a guard who, when necessary, sometimes fulfilled the role of pusher. As for the inspector, he was always very present. Excuse me, sir, can I see your ticket, please? There you are. This is a second-class ticket. But I have some first-class tickets, too. No, sir. First-class tickets are only valid if they've been punched at the entrance to the station. I'm afraid you owe me 50 francs. Madam, your ticket, please. Thank you. Tickets, please. Thank you. Tickets. Thank you. When a passenger is feeling guilty, it's obvious, and that makes the inspector's task easier. Excuse me, sir, do you have a ticket? There you are. This is a second-class ticket, and you are in first. So that'll be 50 francs. 
In such a large crowd, there are bound to be some cheats. But the inspectors have their eyes peeled. One turn on the ticket machine and all is well. When you work with the public, you become a philosopher. Here you are, ma'am. Oh, well, you know, it's not a perfect world. But Paris keeps on the move. Methods of payment have changed over time. The ticket punch was replaced from 1972 on by automatic three-bar turnstiles. Four eighty. Today you can still buy a ticket from the ticket office, but for how much longer? Machines are more and more present and sophisticated. To be a bus driver during the Belle Epoque, you had to know something about machines and really understand your vehicle. Because when you were on the road, you couldn't call out a breakdown service. Yesterday, like today, being a bus driver had certain advantages, especially on some lines. I think it's the best line because, for a start, you go up the Champs-Élysées. And in my opinion, and I've traveled a bit, it's the most beautiful avenue in the world. I like to be driving my bus in winter, especially in December and January, when everything is lit up. There are loads of tourists, and they're always amazed. I've been doing this for 25 years, and even I have to stop sometimes and take some photos, even though I see it every day. Oh yes, some bus drivers are photographers too. You also had to be polyvalent and know your vehicle if you were a tram driver. Even if the tram had priority, it wasn't allowed to exceed 20 kilometers an hour in Paris. And the driver had to go carefully when the track forked, so as not to shake the passengers up too much. Driving a tram today, is it simpler or more complicated? Well, the first time I went for training, I found it quite complicated. But in fact, if you're well trained, it's very simple to drive. All the buttons that you can see here, 
Well, there are mainly buttons to change the lights at crossroads, control the doors, the opening and closing of the doors. Underground, the rails are different. The drivers are different. In the past, the metro driver had to be French, have done his military service, and be at least 1 meter 60 tall. He worked 9 hours and 45 minutes a day with one day off every week. All that has changed a bit today. It's changing. We're heading more and more towards automation. But make no mistake, we're still going to keep our, shall we say, professional character, of course. or elsewhere, accident-free public transport has never existed. There are collisions. Mechanical breakdowns. The possibility of getting drenched. Skids that may or may not be controlled. Outbreaks of fire. Derailments. Fog, when the pilot stick comes into use. To avoid trouble, you just had to follow the stick. Or even floods, like the Great Flood of 1910. The station master has always had a crucial role to play in ensuring safety. In particular, he ensures contact with the line manager and the control room that swings into action when something goes wrong. At 2048, Ecole Militaire. Power switched off, Lamotte Piquet, Madeleine section. Smoke detected at marker 434. Beauvais, reference number 2327. Switch the current back on in the Lamotte Piquet, Madeleine section. It's the same principle today, with slightly more modern equipment. The ultimate in technology, the Meteor line, line 14, for example, is completely automatic. 
500,000 passengers use it every day, watched over by the cameras of the PCC, the command and control post. Number of metro passengers in 1900, 17,700,000. Number of passengers one year later, nearly 60 million. Number of passengers today, nearly 1,050,000,000 a year. But it was in 1945, the year the war ended, that all records were broken. More than 1,500,000,000 passengers. The metro is full of life. From the very start, the Paris Metro has been frequented by musicians seeking artistic recognition and a place to perform. Today, 300 musicians are accredited, and they're not just any old musicians. I've opened for Keziah Jones, Nene Cherry, and I mean, all that is thanks to the Metro. The Metro is a school, it's a rehearsal room, and it's a color, it's a country, the Metro. You really have to sing. You have to try to catch everyone's eye, every passerby. Because when you sing in a concert, people have paid, so they come. They're going to see your concert, whether it's good or bad. But when you play in the metro, they're not interested. They all walk past, they're in a hurry. But when one of them stops and listens, it's because he's really interested. He really likes it. And still, Paris keeps on the move. Metro is a closed world. It needed openings to the outside, openings for people to dream. One of the solutions was advertising, drawn by a very large captive audience. In 1932, the Metro carried slightly more than two million passengers a day. In 1942, more than three and a half million. If we put end-to-end -end the distance run by the trains in service, we would get a total of 80,000 kilometers. That's twice round the Earth. There has always been a lot of traffic. The greatest volume of traffic on the RATP was at the end of the Second World War. 
And there was a very high peak of traffic from 1998 to 2000. And obviously, this was the audience that advertisers were aiming at. For Norbert Mayer, Metrobus Publicité's innovations director, advertising in the metro has always been tied to two imperatives the liveliness of the space and profitability. The idea, obviously, was to liven up the RATP spaces and make them pay, to create income to supplement the income from transport. Some of the adverts from the metro deserve a place in Paris's heritage. Because advertising is not confined just to the poster. There's been paint on the walls, there's been tiling. There have been many different ways of utilizing the space. The metro is a world, a living space, which has to be maintained. And at night, it has always been scrubbed and polished. To avoid stress, the world of the metro must also be a place for pleasure, and above all, it has to fit into a certain logic. Yo Kaminagai is head of design at the RATP. I often compare the transport space to a sort of stage where characters have to take part in a play. The seats, an information system, the signs, rolling stock, all these elements are characters in the urban transport play that the passenger, who is in fact the spectator and the actor in the performance, watches. Yes, the Metro is in some way a show. A show that is not always easy to stage. The difficulty is that these characters have been generated by directors from different periods, and there may be several directors, so we are finally the director's director. We bring together the actors as a whole so that the story will be realistic and that in the passenger's journey, one step should lead to the next in the easiest and most logical way possible. There's nothing more logical, too, than designing certain stations in relation to Paris at ground level. The Louvre station is a fine example. Once he steps off the train, the passenger feels he is already in one of the shrines of world culture. Or the Tuileries station, viewed as a heritage station. 
On the walls are collages showing the history of each of the decades of the 20th century. For the 1940s, Charlie Chaplin meets Bécassine. The Concorde station is covered with a giant scrabble made up of the letters of the Declaration of Human Rights. The curved roof of the station at Cluny-la-Sorbonne is covered with the signatures of celebrities of the Latin Quarter. Arts et Métiers is the antechamber of the museum devoted to science and technology. Suddenly, we are transported into the world of Jules Verne's Nautilus. They are inimitable. You can't visit Paris without being struck by the curving lines of the Art Nouveau metro entrances. They're signed by the architect Hector Guimard, who created them for the Compagnie du Métro Parisien. The objective, or the idea, is to give an image of the metro which is extremely modern, of a utopia created at a time when in fact the metro frightened people. Yes, at the beginning some people thought that Parisians would be afraid to take the metro. This is one of the reasons that Guimard banked on a reassuring aesthetic. But the Guimard style didn't please everyone. And the man who was nicknamed the Bard of Art Nouveau was fired by the Compagnie du Métro Parisien in 1904. Today, his work is part of the heritage of Parisian culture. The elements of the 86 entrances which survive, out of the 141 that were built, are carefully maintained by craftsmen who still have the original molds. Don't look for the stations called Martin Nadeau, AXO, or Arsenal on the street plan of Paris. These are stations that did exist at one time but have since closed. These ghost stations sometimes never opened. This is the case, for example, with the AXO station. The platforms were built, but the stairs coming up to the street level were never opened. Now you are in what we call a ghost station, at Croix Rouge on line 10. Yes, the station at Croix Rouge has been closed since 1939 and is now only used by ghosts. Sometimes the ghosts have the chance to learn about modern art and culture. Nevertheless, this station, since its whole volume is intact, has from time to time been used for cultural events. For example, 
In the 1980s, there was a beach here. And in 2008, we had an exhibition of the National Library. After these events, the Croix Rouge station was handed back to its ghosts. We also have, and this is important, a station at Porte des Lilas, which is not used except as a film set. Whenever the Paris Metro appears in a film, it's highly likely that it was shot here. This station is, of course, used according to the décor, which uh, is required by the director. And it has been used in great films. I'm thinking particularly of La Grosse Caisse, with the actor Bourville, which in the 1960s gave us a glimpse into the backstage of the Paris Metro. Between film shoots, the ghosts can sleep undisturbed because these stations are not open to the public. The station has to keep its mystery. It's really an atmosphere that is captured on film. The stations are alive. They're born and, of course, sometimes they die. And always, Paris keeps on the move. Singer Yves Montand said in The Ballad of Paris, the years have slipped gently by, but Paris is still aged 20. The Seine has made its bed between the gray of its banks in Paris. She must be feeling that all is well, because she is still there today. <laughs> 